before we begin, one last thing. There's a number of you in this room um, who ought to go on to do a PhD. I'm just saying. So if I haven't talked to you directly, because you may or may not have been around, I mean to be talking to you. So don't uh, think that uh, just because I haven't gotten to you, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> A PhD is a tough thing. You just need to start thinking about it now if you're interested. Uh, for not next year, well, you can think about it for next year if you're full time. But if you're full time and have no money, or you're um, part time, then you need to think about it for the following year, um, because all the all the grants are pretty much um, they've already been distributed. Uh, it is very difficult to get a grant um, if you don't have a distinction in your MA. So if that is the case, do not be forlorn, uh, because there are other ways of getting grants, um, uh, which means that you have to think about getting supported by a gallery or something. something. Well, we, we can talk about that if anybody's interested in that kind of thing, and you don't have the marks, then we can think about it some other way. But for those of you that do have um, uh, distinctions in your master's and possibly first in your BA, some of you don't even have BAs, I know that, uh, but those of you that do, you need to have a first. For those of you that took a BA in the year one, um, and it wasn't a first, uh, they often will ignore that. So, but think about it. Think about. And how much is it for pay? How much how, is how the PhD? I mean, let's say it would take me eight years. I think. I don't know for sure, but I thank you. I think it's about thirty-six hundred pounds a year. I think it's pretty much what it is for the MA. I mean, part time. That is part time. Yeah. Part time is I think thirty-six hundred. I think their fees are around seven thousand a year or something like that. Mm -hmm. I just, could be just making this. Like, just same like. Yeah, I'm sort of probably making this up because I don't know. And I went to a workshop the other day where I think it was four grand a year for full time and two grand a year for part time, but that's for six years, so it works out as twelve grand anyway. Okay. But that's what I heard the other day. Oh, that's very helpful. Okay, that's great. But the other thing is, I strongly recommend that unless you know precisely what your topic is on, that you go part time. You can always finish earlier, okay? mm -hmm. but they are draconian right now. It's not running. Hello, Dane. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that it, you know, there are, you know, you talk to any of the PhD students that have their knuckles on the ground. They're sort of like dragging themselves around because you have all these, um, you know, forms to fill out every five minutes. There's yet another form to say, you know, where are you in the process? And you know, the process. I'm right here. <laughs> you know, it's like so. So. You just have to sort of deal with that, and that that is a relentless thing. Although uh, one of the reasons I was not late, but let's say expanded time, uh, was because um, I I also have to fill this out for my job. <laughs> so it's just like it's just honestly, you just really want people to take a little bit of a break from forms, yeah. So so to apply for PhD, the no, when I finish next year. Yeah. So I can apply this time next year. You, no, you should apply, if you're thinking of going in 2017, mm -hmm. you should apply, you should start thinking about applying in September 2016, you should get your, so this September, this September mm -hmm. coming, um, to apply for the AHRC grants. Without the grants. Okay. Then you can wait till February. Okay, no grants. Okay. If you don't want a grant, if you're, if you're going to go without a grant, then you want February, March is fine. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to do a grant, then you have to basically begin figuring out your grant scenario, like what's your project, because these grants are ridiculous. I mean, in the sense that they, they do require a pound of flesh or more. Um, so you need to figure out how to write your project up in 4,000 characters in oh. spaces, for example. And if you don't think in terms of 4,000 characters, including spaces, you gotta start thinking that way. Um, your title has to be 120 spaces, 120 characters including spaces. Yeah. So, like I said, that me if you can do your title in 120 characters including spaces, then you kind of know what you're doing. And that's how they do it. That that's how they cut you out or bring you in. They don't see it as being creative to come up with like a three-page paragraph of your title. Nobody thinks that the Jacobean time period is useful for this now. So you can't do any of that kind of thing. So you really need to think about this. And you really should talk to me about it. Uh, they're bringing in, they're, we're going to have new hires coming in. There'll be some more, um, th there's going to be a big effort to make this into a, a research, you know, uh, center. 
like depending on the, the wind, <laughs> like I think, you know, one day they're closing down CFR, the next day they're not closing it down. The next day they're not closing it down, it's now going to be Harold and that's a great research center, so God knows. You know, <laughs> like you got, this is why you should never give up. This is, this is, this is the reason, because, you know, as horrible as things are at the one minute, they, they totally change. And you're just like, and you might not even do anything, you might just be sitting there going, I'm going to say something, and before you even get that part out, you know, suddenly it's all changed. In fact, yesterday, for example, while I was getting depressed about various things and all the work I had to do, like you guys do, post comes, you know, something comes in the post, I open it up, it's a letter from Barclays saying, we now um, will admit that we owe you 12,279 pounds and 91 pence for PPI. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, at first I thought it was a joke. And I had to call them, and they said, no, no, we, we owe you this money. From 19, I had a credit card in 1978 uh, to 99. Somewhere in that period, I paid PPI. And somewhere they had a record of it, and somewhere they sent me this thing. That's a little sick. That is awesome. I just thought I'd faint. You know, I was like, that is like I was, you know, it came exactly the right time. You know, because as you know, my, my partner's father is very ill, and we needed to come up with money. And it was just like, wow. So you see, you see what I mean? <laughs> you know, you just, you know, you just hang in there. You wait for chapter 26 or 36. Okay. How many people are thinking about a PhD? One, two. Good, 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 good. Excellent. You are not too old. Well, I, I You're not even forty. I, I did tell you before. I, I know you have the answer to this. If, if I were to do one, if I was motivated, yes, uh, I'd be seventy-three before I finished. So, and your, your reply to that was, um, your best student was eighty. Yes. Yes. Did, did she make no. it again to the course? <laughs> she 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 was, she was Are you <laughs> Am I eighty? Am I what? Eighty years old. One hundred and fifty minimum. See, see, so if Henry can be one hundred and fifty, you can certainly do your PhD at seventy-three. Yes, I'm sure. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's been like that all day. <laughs> I always want you to know. I've had meetings, 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 and people come and go. Oh, there's a meeting, and then they just sort of stand there. You're like, yes. Okay. I'm glad to, so when, when you feel like it, drop me a line about your PhD. <clears throat> Wait a second. Emirate, are you applying for a PhD? I didn't see your hand go up. Yes, is the answer. Okay, that's good. What's that? I would like to get a recording for this session. Okay. At least for a moment. Is he coming back? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. We might have to start. Yes, I understand. Oh, it's not on? I don't think it is, unless it is not in India. But you'll be the like, like a red a light, like you can see. I'll have a look. Honestly, this is not, this is the example of the day. No, I'm not like an idiot on the on the on the internet. That's right. It's not on. It's on. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Twice. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No, it's nice. When's Dane coming? He's come and gone. Really? Well, we've got to turn it on. <laughs> it's on. Great. Okay. Um, good. Well, that's very exciting because um, this is this is an interesting place. So, oh, the other thing is that if you're willing to apply for the, or if you're willing and want to apply or are in a position to apply for the AHRC, you need to think about getting a second supervisor. Well, assuming that you're going to come here. <laughs> you don't have to come here, but... Your second supervisor has to be someone in the partnerships. So and the, part the M3C stands for Midlands Three Cities. Their clue is in the name. So, spoiler alert, there are three cities involved with the M3C. So, in the Midlands. So, it's Birmingham, uh, Nottingham, and uh, where's Dumontford? Leicester. Okay. So, and so there's the, th there's the three cities, and there's two universities in each city. And it's basically the, you know, the, the, the the, the university that lives on one side of the tracks and the university that lives on the other side of the tracks. So in Birmingham, it's the University of Birmingham and BCU. I leave it up to you to figure out what track we're talking about. <laughs> then in Leicester, it's University of Leicester and Dumontford. And in Nottingham, it's Nottingham Trent and University of Nottingham. What you do is you go on those sites <clears throat> and you look to see um, who, if anyone, or any group is interested in the kind of work you're doing. 
and um, and then you go approach them completely like a cold call, so you kind of like a Fuller Brushman. Do you know what a Fuller Brushman is? No. <coughs> Only one person this one could conceivably know. So yes. <laughs> Someone that would knock on your door with a suitcase full of brushes and try and sell you a brush. Okay, anyway, you've got to be like that. You gonna you know what a cold call is, right? Yeah. Okay, so at least we're at that level. <laughs> so depressing. I think I told you this the other day. I was talking to somebody who was headhunting me for a position, uh, and she asked me, she was saying something, she was like, what is your work about? So I was explaining, I said, well, you know, I just sort of do things like uh, in the nature of like what Laurie Anderson does. And she was like, who is Laurie Anderson? Okay, well, what about Lou Reed? Well, who's Lou Reed? I said, seriously? And you were headhunting me? <laughs> like, are you... no. I don't know what your organization does, but no. Anyway, uh, any other questions? I'm, I'm perfectly happy to look at all revisions and stuff like that. I hope that if you haven't talked to me directly about your book reviews, you will. I haven't got an email from you. I oh, that's what I haven't sent you. I was, yeah, I was expecting an email saying, like, yeah, it was me that time or something. Um, was I meant you to be to proactive? Be. Yes. Because I emailed you saying, okay. You all have to be proactive with me. You know this by now. Okay. This is like... <laughs> I just asked what I did find Thank you. Please, please, email me. if you want to have me to sit down and talk to you about your work, you have to email me. I'm sorry. There is only so many hours in the day that I can put aside to doing admin. So um, you must email me. You must take the step. You must cross the threshold. You must let me know. That you need to teach for it. Like, at the end of the session, can I just book a time? I, I no. Oh. You need to send me an email. I have. Oh, okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are we good to go? Today, see, the great thing about this class is that we're now, um, we're really on March 8th and 15th. Today is the 15th. Uh, but we're going to try and sort of combine some of this so that we get to March 22nd by 4.30 today. <laughs> and we get to March 31st by this evening. Oh no, that's wrong. No, we don't do that. We get to March 31st the week we come back. Right. Okay. And we get to, oh, okay. So we have plenty of time. Okay. So all we have to do today is March 15th in this section and 8th, and then in the evening, the 22nd. Okay. And if you guys understood that already, you are PhD students. Okay. Excellent. Okay, well done. All right, here we go. I'm going to, first of all, remind you that the essays are due whenever they're due, the 19th of April at 12 midday, and there are no extensions, nothing like that. So please, 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 if you're running into trouble, if you're freaking out, something like that, send in even a blank piece of paper at this point. Just get something uploaded onto the web so that you have a marker. I mean, obviously, everyone would have a legitimate excuse, and if, 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 if I, you know, have you ever see The Wizard of Oz? Yeah. You know, the, the Tin Man, you know, if I, you know, ruled the devil, that's what I feel like. If I ruled, I mean, we would not have these stupid extenuating circumstances because nobody ever gets things on on time, but I'm not ruling the world. Sadly, you have to get it in by midday. That's 12 noon. So I would suggest in your head, think the day before or in the morning, however you have to, whatever trick you have to play on yourself to get it in. Uh, and that would be great. <coughs> the essay questions are tough. They are meant to be tough. There are no answers to them. There are, of course, exact answers to them. So um, between now and um, tonight, if you want, think about whether or not you want me to go over them again one more time. But in the meantime, here's what you have to have as, a, as in your arsenal now. This course was meant to get you to think in plural terms. Now, plural does not necessarily mean the same as multiple, although that's kind of the same. Plural means many, so does multiple. But plural's version of many is that there are different kinds of elements or ingredients 
they're not all the same, that are proliferating in, let's call it a set or an environment, that for some reason they all belong in that environment. Translation. You can have, I don't know, water, coffee, this wire here, the books. There is a plurality of things on the table. You wouldn't say there's a multiplicity of things. Because you know that a multiplicity of things in, brings in the view that something is itself being repeated a number of times. So multiplicity means something itself is being repeated a number of times. Plurality means that there is now long word, could become a scrabble word, heterogeneic, H-E-T-E-R, O, hetero, G-E-N-E-I-C, heterogeneic. And heterogeneic means the, the environment of, of many belonging together, but all different. Or anyway, could be all different. They don't have to be all different. Another way of looking at that, let's think about snow falling. Snowflakes are apparently, there's not any two alike. Somehow I don't believe that, but, you know, but that is the argument. And in fact, in certain languages, there's like 150 words for a snowflake and so on and so forth. When you think, think of snow, it looks like a big surface of white plane going out there. But in fact, it's heterogeneically an ensemble of lots of different little flakes. Notice how I snuck in the word ensemble. E-N-S-E-N, -E -S, sorry, E-N-S-E-M-B-L-A-G-E, -E, ensemblage, which is kind of the same word as assemblage. Assemblage means that something has been put together to create its cohesion so that it ends up looking like it makes sense or in fact literally making sense. Like how, how something is understood is one way of understanding this, is one way of like defining making sense. How something is made, like literally the making of sense, is the other way. So assemblages bring this in. Now, one more piece of the puzzle before we sort of go on. Sorry, I'm getting holded. We started in this course trying to understand the Heideggerian move of A equals A. And that, if, if you can master just that in this course, you have already done a lot. I want to remind you that A equals A, the problem that was being looked at by Heidegger was the problem we identified in last semester in contemporary philosophy and aesthetics under Hegel, which was that identity, that is to say the meaning of something. So I just talked about making sense, like literally some, how something comes to be made sense of. That the making of sense which then gives it its meaning. Its meaning is then linked to this thing called identity. For Hegel requires a unity. Requires all things that are, plus all things that are not, stuck together, synthesized, so you know that one becomes sublated into the other. The synthesis becomes the overarching concept, which comes back around and forms the ground of meaning. Anybody not get that one? See, this is the thing that's so painful about Hegel. He is so logical that people get him. Whereas Deleuze and Guattari, who are so much more interesting, they, they talk in such, you know, like rambling LSD ways that you just want to like knife in the head. So anyway, sorry, it's my own little thing. Okay, so Hegel makes the argument that you start with nothing. You start with the not. You start with the with the no time, the nout time, the no thing. 
and you put it against intuition. And that becomes your first move. But in order to make that your first move, you have to accept that you can never be in the present. You can only approach the present. Because the minute you try to get to the present, it jumps and goes somewhere else, because then it goes to the future, it goes to the past. So one's always in the process of getting somewhere, but never actually getting to the there. You never get there, you're always going there. Heidegger disagrees with this view, and he wants, partly because he is emphasizing art in a very different way than Hegel is, what Heidegger is saying is that in order to understand, <laughs> understand how meaning is made, you have to come, come away from, step away from the concept, and don't have the concept organize your way into the question. Rather, you have to see how things are attracted to each other. And it's not just anything being attracted to each other. It is, as he puts it, he starts off with the Parmenides position of A is, A belongs to this thing called A. They are stuck together by the equal sign. That's how they belong together, but they're not collapsed onto themselves. They're not collapsed onto themselves because if they were, they wouldn't have an identity. It'd just be a blob. So in order for us to know that it's A equals A, they have to be both separate and together. And this is where he gets into his, in his identity and difference, he gets into that long speech about belonging, on the one hand, A belongs to A, and on the other hand, wanting to be alone, wanting just to be, wanting to be separate. One has to be careful, because obviously I'm not, and neither Heidegger, suggesting that a concept has, an, has a mood, like I want him, the concept wants to be or doesn't want to be, but the idea here is that there's solitude and there's belonging, and you, the positioning is that that is required at the same time. That it is absolutely, makes perfect sense that one longs to belong, and at the same time, the moment you might be belonging, you long not to belong just want to be left alone. So it's the be belonging and the wanting to be. Belonging and wanting to be. And this is the relationship between the Dasein, the there, Dasein, and the smaller entity, whatever is pulling that smaller entity to whatever is there. So Dasein pulls the entity, in this case he says it's man, by which he doesn't mean, well, probably does mean male men, but he's meaning this thing called the human, the human, you have the human being, and then you have big B being. So you have, and, and the human being, the small being, is pulled toward big B being, but if, if a human being was pulled in too much, they would be swallowed. So there's a, a somehow it's pulled apart. And so Heidegger asks the question, how does it happen? Because logically we know it has to happen, but the question is, how does it really happen? And what Heidegger argues is that it has to happen with the way in which one understands how difference is within the relationship of belonging. So, in other words, in order to belong, if you belong, 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 you just collapse and become nothing. So in order to prevent that collapse, there has to be some kind of break. But he doesn't agree with Heidegger, sorry, he doesn't agree with Hegel that that break is now time or nothing. It's something, it's just not something you can touch or feel. And that's something he calls difference. Understood? Sure? Say what you don't, say what you don't understand. No, because we got to nail this so in order no, to go forward. I think I do okay. Now we so we're gonna we're gonna put Heidegger to one side with one last point, which is that what Deleuze develops from that position is basically two major positions from this notion of A equals A, from this notion of the equal sign. So you got this. So you have this A equals A. So there's an attraction to each other, but there's also a way of being of, of staying apart. So we could make the equal sign like this. 
But of course, the equal sign could be like this. It could be quite, you know, it could be the, the whole height of both A's. That could be an equal sign. Or in fact, the equal sign could look like, I don't know, could look like this. Because think about a magnetic field, if that helps you. Think about something that's pulling something together and keeping it apart. The, the, the apartness is because of the difference. Now, Deleuze makes two, minimally two, but two inter interventions. The first intervention is that he says, all this difference is very interesting, but Heidegger has forgotten about radical difference. And radical difference is the diff is difference that is not just established between human being and Dasein. Radical difference is established because the youth, the, the, because the way in which um, <clears throat> put this, the way in which the attraction occurs. Deleuze is going to call it, Deleuze and Deleuze and Quattari are going to call it an encounter. Now, we could cross in the street and, in a certain sense, encounter each other, but we may not really encounter each other. So the question is, when do you actually encounter something? When does it matter? Like, when does it make matter happen? When does that encounter count? Well, on the one hand, it counts. It becomes obvious. It becomes something you think about. It becomes something that could change your whole being when you allow yourself to get rid of recognition. When you allow yourself to not cognize, to not rely on the rational, the rational logic, but allow the logic of the senses to direct your way of facing whatever it is you're facing. Which part? Just what you just said. Okay. Letting go of recognition. What? That letting go of recognition is that? Yeah, yeah. Just from that. Okay. Let's let's put it like this. Recognition. What is the problem with recognition? The problem with recognition is that it takes it requires a concept in order to operate. So, and in fact, if you, if you take apart that word recognition, it's actually recognition. So there's a cognition that's then uh, played again, played again, and again, and again. So the, so the, the recognition, the recognition immediately brings someone to a place, but already has colored the way in which that's going to be seen. Now, this is the problem with metaphor. Metaphor always does, and this is the problem with representation. Because representation will always require a cognition before you can actually engage the work. And the work can be anything. The work can be a painting. The work can be you know eating food. The work can be yourself as your own work of art. But it's this. It's this way of encountering the what and the how without putting an extra layer on it of trying to figure out what it means. There's no figuring out. You're just letting it be. And once you let it be, it belongs. And how does it belong? It belongs to the encounter. So that belonging and that letting it be names what, well, or what Deleuze and Guattari name is radical difference. So in the first version of difference, the Heideggerian move of difference, you have this ex example of A being attracted to A. So you have this kind of wind tunnel thing going on. I want you to know that I'm showing you this on my performance review folder, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, had to do, I had to do this last night, 2 AM. Anyway, so you have. A is attracted to A. They belong together. At the same time, they're not the same, literally the same thing. There's somehow a distance. So that's somehow distance is what Heidegger is calling uh, difference. But he also calls that distance 
per durance. So another way of understanding the word per durance here is that per durance is the length of distance that's created either by time or by place or by thinking or by techna. Somehow the per durance is a duration known as durance, per durance. P-U-R, P-E-R, sorry, D-U-R-A-N-C-E, P-E-R, D-U-R-A-N-C-E, perdurance. Violetta, frown face. Making sense or is just going in one eye and out the other? Yeah. Yes, it's I'm making sense it or in. yes, it's not making sense? No, it's making sense. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's making sense. Okay. <laughs> not the no, the no one's okay. supposed to be there. Fred? I have a question that is low. Kind of off topic, but I was wondering what the where the difference comes in between uh, aphorisms and metaphors. What do you mean by aphorism in that example? Oh, I don't know. Okay, but I know that they are different. Well, they're very different. Yeah. Yes. What's a metaphor? Give me an example of a metaphor. I got my mind's gone blank. Can anybody do a metaphor? Why is that? Why, why, why that look? I always think of that one as the, as the, as the most interesting one. The sun rises? Yeah, because it doesn't really rise. It's, it's, it's saying what it's like. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, right. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> right. Okay. So what, but a metaphor literally means the standing in for something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So representation is representing the present. It's multiple, but, but in reality, or in some reality, in some real reality, representation also means itself. So you could say that a figural painting like this over here that um, is, is um, whatever, we have different versions of it, that was done by the artist Emily Sparks. <clears throat> you could say that the all figural painting, but anyway, this one, looks like it's telling you a story. Looks like it's either allegorical or apoc apocryphal or something. You know, that, they, that something is being represented there. I think that Emily would probably fall over and weep in her soup if, in fact, it was actually seen this way. But people often see, because it's, it's hard to see through figure. It's easier, as it were, to see, you know, kind of abstracty thing because it says, I'm really not telling you a story. Well, maybe I am. Well, maybe I'm not. You know, na 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 Whereas that, because it's, we recognize those figures, even if we don't know what that baby with the wings are, you know, it, it looks like there's a story being told, and therefore it looks like something is being presented to you in a non-direct uh, sense, and that's representation. And metaphor, what metaphor does with representation is that it takes representation and pushes it one more level, by doing like the sun rises, but it's not really rising, but we're so used to it, or the world is round, or the, you know, whatever the thing is. That an aphorism, on the other hand, like let's say the Nietzschean aphorisms, they may be doing that, but probably are presenting just the is. So the question becomes, how do you present the is? Oh, it, and here, here's the real question. That's, that's a, that's a sub-question. In your work, in everyone's artwork, the artwork somehow deals with and is. It deals with this encounter. It, it requires an encounter that is both at the same time logical and completely devoid of logic. It has to be logical on some level, or it wouldn't make any sense. And it wouldn't be able to make sense. But if we lose how to make logic, if logic is no longer this A follows B follows C follows D, because there's a whole lot of problems with that. There's too much, there's grounds, there's, there's a, a rigidity of thinking, there's a division, a, a bifurcation, a dualism. If that's going to be overthrown, if that's going to somehow be in some other situation, there needs to be something that's logical. There needs to be some form of way of understanding the is, because otherwise you're just be ending up with your, uh, you know, your your viewpoint. 
and however brilliant you might be, it's not going to be necessarily accurate for in all scenarios. So the question becomes, how do you move from the universal that Hegel puts forward, which does present excellent logic, only it is a little bit reactionary, because it sets, like, you know, um, all that there is against all that there's not, or it can be reinterpreted in men, women, black, white, Jew, Christian, whatever the story is. It has these bifurcations in it that end up being read back into the culture, and it creates this so-called unity. So if you get rid of that, if you're thinking radical, if you're going to go for the radical difference that Deleuze is talking about, or trying to name, then you have to have a different kind of logic. And this is where we move, I'm going to move back, uh, well, this is where we get into the question of the rhizome, and we get into the question of really how they're thinking through heterogeneity, multiplicity, this rhizome logic, the sporing that happens, and what makes it stick. Now, I'm going to just set that for a second there because we'll go through we're going to uh, we'll go through the rhizome again and the cartographies and whatnot. But just to remember that Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari are suggesting that there's a map. There's a you need to understand that the logic is a map, but it's not a map that tells you where to go. The map might not even have a direction. In fact, if it's a good map, it won't have a direction because it's just the is. But it's a, it's a cartography, it's a, it's a way in which points of place can be set up, but they, they're not carved in stone. They're, they're able to be, uh, they're able to carve out a place or a space but that place or space is not something that is necessarily permanent. I'm going to give you an example, because that sounds all very crazy. In the early days of, of gay liberation, uh, when we had uh, uh, Stonewall, um, this was, uh, as you may know, whether or not it's a true story or apocryphal story, I'm not sure, but it's fairly true. So there was this donut store and the donut store, the guy didn't want to sell the donuts to these drag queens because they were drag queens and he had enough with drag queens and he just thought, I don't want you in my store. This is the, fa this is the founding of the, the gay movement. It's like fantastic. And, um, and so one of the queens was totally annoyed and just had it with the, all the taunting and this and threw the donut back at the manager. And the manager, rather than like, I don't know, saying, you know, you're an idiot, or you know, I hate you, and blah blah blah. Took a whole bunch of more donuts and threw them at those guys. Then the biker dykes, who happened to also be there, grabbed a bunch more donuts, and there was a huge food fight. <laughs> this is the start of Stonewall. <laughs> it's fantastic. I mean, it was it was nasty. I mean, because uh, the police came with the dogs and they set the dogs on, and so the the women were the 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 dykey you know, the kind of, uh, the leather dykes, as we would say, they were like on the front line. They got, they got taken out of the story, which is very annoying. But anyway, they were part of the main group. And there grew out of that moment the notion of gay, which didn't mean gay men. It didn't mean gay women. It just meant something other than this thing called lesbian or gay male or homosexual or any of these other terms that were had been medicalized. It was a way of claiming a term like queer is now. It was claiming this term. And the only place you could really be in a gay place was in a nightclub. And in fact, you might wonder why a lot of the uh, demonstrations were always at night. They were always at night in part because people didn't want to be seen, it was very scary, you could be arrested, you could be killed, it was horrible. You, we often had uh, water thrown on us, I mean water guns, you know, it's kind of like really tough stuff. But the other reason is because it's night. You know, maybe you'll find somebody. You know, it could be fun. So I always loved that about gay demonstrations because even though they were like at the cusp of like some violent scenario going on, you could actually find somebody to go home with because it was the night. 
and you never know what happens in the night. So the night became a safe space, which is almost unheard of these days where you think the night is not safe. But it was a safe space, and those spaces fell into clubs, different clubs. And that's where the identities grew. There were little gardens. Now, nobody said, here's, where, here's how to have a gay identity. First, you have to go into a donut store. You know, then you have to have a food fight. You have to make sure that the dikes on bikes are nearby with their motorcycles. You know, nobody would have said it like this. That's kind of crazy. But Liz and Deliz and Victoria are trying to figure out, how do you really talk about change? You could say the same thing about the feminist movement, or any of the movements. Any, particularly any of the movements that deal with sexuality, because there's always that's always an issue. You know, so they all they all start with some sort of mad. It's not like people are going, well, you know, I really feel like I need to talk about the dialectic. So how are we going to do this? Let's think here. We're going to go with the concept of what we want to be, and then we're just going to go be it. No, I mean people are dressed in all their wild ways. I mean, and I may have told you this before, but I, when my, my lovely mother, may she rest in peace, when she, you know, she really wanted to understand why I was gay, and I decided it was time to talk about it because it was HIV, head of height of crisis, and she said, you know, I took her to a, um, a gay cafe in, on Old Compton Street, and I, I said, look, you know, we need to talk. She says, I know, I know, but before we talk, I have to ask you this question. So, you know, I figured, you know, are you gay question, no. No, it wasn't that question. The question was, yes. Kate, come in for the bake sale. Come in. Yes, please. Yes, that's lovely. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Wow. Would you like to stay? Would you like to stay? Now. No, I've just finished, that's why. Brilliant. Thank you so much. It's so nice. Another reason I love this place. Everybody take some food to pass around the trays. Don't take, unless you're vegan, don't take those two pieces there. Because that's for someone who's vegan. Oh, yes. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> anyone, anyone? This fun, this is unbelievable. You, you, well, you finished off. <laughs> that's right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I thought that my... Um, lovely mother who looked very much like a movie star. She was Miss New York, so it gives you an idea. Um, anyway, she she said, you know, I need to ask you this question. I, you know, I thought, you know, are you gay? And, and she said, if you look around the room, why can't you dress like these other women? And it was fantastic. And I was like, mother, those people are not women. Those are drag queens. And that's a whole of, of people, you know, that, and she was so astonished, because she, of course, looked like a drag queen, I mean, basically, in this case, she was really, really dressed, really the stiletto heels and all the rest of the thing, and it was, it was wonderful, and, and I just thought to myself, how would Hegel have understood this notion, this moment of identity? There's no way, no way. So what Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari started to do, they're at the zeitgeist when all this is going on. It's still going on, but it's just going on in different ways now. And they wanted to name how this <coughs> works, how the place gets established. So you know you're in a place that's free, or that's in the moment of becoming free. I mean, you know, you can go, you can live in, in places all your life and not be home. When you're home, it turned out, in this case, to be the donut store that, that started Stonewall. And Stonewall, because that was the name of the donut store, not because they, they created a stone wall and they threw bricks or something like that. <coughs> it wasn't like the French Revolution. You know, that's kind of interesting. So the, the, the space, in this case, the food fight, 
that became this huge moment is what Deleuze and Guattari are going to call a plane of imminence. And the plane of imminence, so it's a spatiality that is heterogeneic. There's donuts, there's leather boots, there's very interesting motorcycles, there are big girls wearing leather protecting the drag queens. <laughs> it's fantastic. It's just a, it is a completely nutty environment. It's fabulous. Now, you know, you can always uh, read my, you know, sex politics and community standards which is on academia.edu to get into the, so the, sorry, the sordid truth of various things that went on. But the, the, the task here is that leotard comes into the picture. And what Leotard is saying is that Deleuze and Guattari, for all their beauty of trying to, the, the rhizome, this kind of thing, you know, who would have connected leather boots, checked shirts, bad haircuts with, you know, girls leading the revolution? Who would have done that? I mean, that's a rhizomatic connection. There's nothing essential about that. The idea that that the bad haircuts, the leather boots, the the hardcore motorcycles, the you know the kind of different piercings and tattoos on the girls, next to the uh, high heeled pom pom outfits on the boys, that and then of course there were other people that you might say are the female people wearing different outfits and the male people wearing different outfits, but this was the basic group that had the fight. And what's amazing about that is that it was rhizomatic. Because first the fight happened there, but for some reason it didn't stop there. That's interesting. The police came in, they set their dogs on everybody, people got hurt, people got killed over donuts. But it turns out, of course, it wasn't over donuts. It was never over donuts. Well, maybe it was over donuts. That's really <laughs> So think about it when you think about this thing called the rhizome and it's sporing. The notion of gay spored. It went beyond that little cafe in New York. Just like Dada spored beyond Cafe Voltaire in Zurich. How does that spore, how does that actually happen? How does that, the cultural thing travel? So Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari spend years trying to figure this out. And this is what A Thousand Plateaus is basically dealing with. And in this, they're talking about how the rhizome, which spores, how the plane of imminence, like the nightclubs, are these heterogeneic spaces that bring together things that you would never have thought would work, work. But Leotard wants to push it further. I don't know if Leotard's either more political or less political, I'm not sure, but what he does, and this is what last week's lecture was meant to be about, is that he talks about space as a mobus strip. So here you have uh, Leotard talking about it as a plane of imminence, but here you have, uh, no, no, sorry, here you have Deleuze talking about it as a plane of imminence. And this question of the rhizome, which which is situated around the encounter, the food fight encounter. It's it's, it's got an encounter. It's got a moment. It's got a thing that, that coheres it. It spores. It re recreates its moments in various places. I mean, you don't have to go to the gay movement. I mean, you know, the student movement and the famous 1968 scenarios. All of that. These are all these rhizomatic moments. Actually, you know, let's get to say this. But you could make the argument that the populism, that different forms of populism, like what's happening with Donald Lovely Trump, God help us, um, or um, actually there was, they had a hilarious uh, interview with a woman that he, he gave a um, speech, I'm not sure if you're you know, sober enough to watch these speeches, but anyway, uh, or not sober enough to watch these speeches, but. He, um, he said that he really had no problem with working with women. This was a fantastic sentence. It's just like, I just want to, because, you know, I, I love women. <laughs> I was waiting for some of my best friends are women, but that didn't come. Because, you know, I, women, women are great. In fact, here's my position. My position is that 
clearly men are better at their job than women at the same job, but if you get a really smart woman, she's better than 10 women. <laughs> you know, but, but I can tell you, there are people that do believe that, you know, and, you know, and it's just like, so, so I just want you to know, says Donald Trump, I love women, and in fact, I hired, a, I hired one, um, which was fantastic, you know, here's the woman, she comes in, I hired one to help build, she was the architect on the Trump Towers, of course he doesn't mention her name or anything, he's just the woman, you know, the, the non, the no-name woman who built Trump Towers. So BBC, being BBC, tracks down this woman. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> and she's this hard-bitten New Yorker, you know, with this really like, you know, I, you know well, I, I can tell you about Donald Trump, but you know, he's really, you know, he's a smart boy, he's smart, smart, you know, like I can tell you, smart, he's very smart, but honestly, <laughs> she talks like this. And, and so she says, well, first of all, I want to say that he's a very smart man. Second of all, I find it very irritating that whenever he talks about the woman he hires, he forgets my name. <laughs> he's never, and so they said, well, would you vote for Donald Trump? He says, absolutely not. He's an idiot. He's, he's, a, he's a schoolroom bully. You know, why would you want, a schoolyard bully, why would you want that as president of the United States? <laughs> Fantastic. He's like, oh, finally. Anyway, sorry, slide note. So, but you see how I just told you this story? This story is not completely unrelated to what we're talking about. It's marginally unrelated, but it's spored out and it allows you to create the space of how you're understanding this plane. Now, Leotar would say this plane has a surface. Remember, cast your mind back to the problem of the surface. It's lumpy. Lumpy, but it doesn't have a depth. Yeah. It doesn't have a width. It's a MOBA strip. Which, oh God, behind, can you reach behind the couch there, Nick, on the ground where the MOBA strip has fallen? Um, do you see it? Nope. Oh, it's not a picture, is it? It's, it is no, a picture. No, um, computer box. <laughs> Did you know you had a... <coughs> yeah. <coughs> it's a picture. A picture of a MOBA strip. No, it's, it should be back there. Can't see anything. Anyway, I should do Mova's trip before. You sure? Didn't check one more time. Is a demonstration? Yeah, I showed you the, the how yeah, it works. Mm -hmm. You sure you don't see it behind the box? It's the. Huh? Yeah. Sure. Maybe I could put it somewhere else. Oh, well, I don't know where it is. Okay, anyway, the, the Mova strip thing. In the Mova strip, you have. You're able to draw on it, but it's a one dimensional item. Think about how mad that is one-dimensional that you're drawing on. So Leotard says, the way in which Deleuze and Guattari are thinking this through is still very geometric, still very Cartesian, even though they're trying to fight against it, still very patriarchal, despite their claims that they're trying not to be so. The only way you can understand the whole nuttiness I've just explained and still make sense of it is to understand the world via intensities, plural, and how little fires get started, how they create the tension. And he calls that intensity creating the tension, the tensor band. So now think again, the MOBA strip, you have the MOBA strip, which is a single dimension, but it's still a space. But notice I use the word dimension. It's a dimensional space rather than a geometric space. A plane of imminence works on a geometric plane. A MOBA strip can only really be understood as this moment that, is, that, that makes its appearance via dimensions. Uh, commercial interruption. Tomorrow, I think at 2.30, although I'm not certain, because my brother isn't showing, my brother Frank, who um, some of you may have met, is, is, has been invited, you know, he used to be head of YouTube, so he's been invited to speak at uh, Media Futures in Birmingham, which is at Parkside. And he showed me part of his talk uh, a couple of days ago. 
and there, he, there are these robots, or these uh, drones rather, that people have made up. There's a TED talk on drones. And there's all these little drones, and, and someone throws them out, and they are you leaving? Oh, I have a uh, class at four. Don't have to be. But it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll be back soon. Okay. So all these drones are coming out, and there's this whooping noise. Whoop, 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 whoop. And it turns out, he said, do you know what that noise is? And I said, I have no idea. And he said, that's the death of a star that happened 10 billion years ago, and they're just hearing it now. To me, I mean, that still gives me goosebumps. And to me, the idea that you could hear something that died 10 billion years ago, or whatever the story is, and it, its noise travels until it reaches here is phenomenal. And that's what Leotard is trying to capture. He's trying to capture how you understand time dimensionally in terms of lights, in terms of speed. So that's why you have this tensor band moment going on. It's wild stuff. How is that related to the drones? It's not. I just wanted to tell you about the. Um, it, <laughs> it, maybe you just jump back into. What we no, it was actually the sound I wanted to tell you about, but yeah. you have to go tomorrow to hear it because you can. I mean, I'm sure it's more complicated than that. Um, actually. He uh, was asked to be part of a Pecha Kucha. Now, Frank is not an artist. He had no idea what a Pecha Kucha was. He just thought it was something bizarre. So um, he, they said, well, what are you going to talk about? And he said, well, I have this sort of theory about lily ponds, which is uh, that there's something about multiplicity and this kind of thing with respect to the media. But the guy who was hiring him is from the Conservatoire, and he knows this opera singer named Lily Ponds. So he was amazed that Frank, who is in YouTube, would know about Lily Pons. <laughs> so he said, that's fantastic. So few people can talk about this. And Frank was thinking, well, that's probably true. <laughs> I mean, you know, who talks about Lily Pons, you know, when you think about it, right? So it was only until, like, last week when they sent him the poster that he was speaking about Lily Pons, the opera singer. <laughs> and I said, I, and he goes, so this is going to be kind of interesting because, in fact, I'm talking about Lily Pons. Ponds <laughs> with a D S, and this is Lily Ponds with this opera thing, but it still connects because it's a rhizomatic link, and you'll see if you if you go to this thing. Anyway, um, questions? Any questions before we take a break? I, I, I sort of lost the bit about the tense. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the intensities were important in this sort of sporing. Yeah, let's turn to page. Let Let's turn to the glossary where it says the great ephemeral skin. Let's go to that. This is in libidinal economy. Yeah, it's, oh, sorry, it's in libidinal economy, yeah. So, if you turn to uh, the glossary, do you remember last week when we opened up the skin? We read the, the whole thing about cutting the skin and how dramatic that was, laying it out, and the whole question of that being Hagen theatrics. If you just, we'll, we'll turn to that in a second, but go to um, on the glossary. <coughs> to is it, the number nine. James, you want to read this? The libidinal band, just number nine. You have to go to ten. Um, libidinal band skin, the band, which has most importantly neither an inside nor an out, nor an outside is most easily comparable to what Freud called the primary processes of the pulsions of the physical apparatus and can be considered as a sort of analogical presentation of difference independent of the secondary orders of representation in which identity, signification, and reference are determined. Okay, stop right there. So now, can you read it again, that sentence, this time everyone concentrating on James's voice Especially when you start talking about an inside, neither an inside nor an outside. So think about this singularity, the surface, 
that has neither an inside nor an outside is not porous. You're not going through the skin, but it does act as a limit somehow. Somehow it limits, but doesn't limit. It pr produces like a surface, like the nightclub scene, or like the coffee cup scene, you know. So try it again. The li libidinal band, skin, the band, which has most importantly neither an inside nor an outside, is most easily comparable to what Freud called the primary processes of the pulsions of the psychical apparatus and could be considered as a sort of analogical presentation of difference, independent of, this, of the secondary orders of representation in which identity, signification, and reference are determined. Okay, now stop right there. So let's just think about this. Freud calls the primary processes of the pulsions of the psychical apparatus. What do you think is pulsions? What are this force? What are the forces that he talks about? Pulses. Traits. But there's some very real basic ones that he talks about. Drives. Libido. <coughs> it is libido. One is... The sexual and the death. Well, one, yeah, one is death and one is pleasure. pleasure. Right? Death drive and pleasure drive. And these are, there's just the two of them, but there's more. He says that the band, which is neither inside nor outside, is created out of these pulsions, out of these uh, libidinal death drives and life drives and pleasure drives and hunger drives, this curiosity. So he's trying to get into the rawness of the logic, as it were. And, pe and could be considered a sort of analogical presentation of difference. So what does analogical mean here? What does logical mean here? Something that produces logic. That's good. <laughs> okay, so a logic would be if A then B, if B then C. That would be a logic then so if A then B, if B then C, then A equals C. Right. Okay? If A then B, if B then C. Or if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a very specific logic. That's a mathematical logic. It's a very basic position of logic, mm -hmm. right? But what if you can think without doing that kind of logic? So he calls it an analogic, A-N-A. -A. A, a type of logic that is not if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. It's a different form of logic. It's a logic that is form is conditioned by the senses, the drives, the hungers, the curiosities, the appetites. And he says that that analogical presentation is basically Leotard's version of difference. So we've got Heidegger's version of difference. Well, first of all, we've got Hegel's version of difference, which is negation. We've got Heidegger's version of difference, which is this relationship of belonging, not belonging, which it deals with perdurance. We've got Deleuze and Guattari's notion of difference, which brings in this relationship between the rhizome and the plane of imminence, but it radicalizes it in the same way that one understands a plane of imminence or a space as something, as a plane, that can be established because of the way it gets established, not because there's some set idea of how it should be established. It gets established in the establishing of its establishment. Just keep going back to the food fight. And then, it, then but he's saying there's something else here because What's being left out is the rawness, the hunger of various types of entities that make up life, including death, including boredom, including melancholy. All these things also come in. And those things should also be counted as parts of difference. <clears throat> so he says that they're independent of, re of representation in which the usual notions of identity exist. And then it says, okay, go on, James, although. 
Although the libidinal band allows Neotard to show that what is necessarily excluded by representational thinking is not to be considered to be descriptively true, since the model would then collapse back into representation, but as more forceful and more interesting and more inventive than previous totalizations of the real, as a kind of persuasive fiction, the various descriptions of the band wish nevertheless to account for the closures and exclusions inherent to representational thinking and suggest a pagan manner of affirming the differences and singularities that run through the libidinal band in an aleatory and indeterminate fashion. So what do you think that means? What is a pagan manner of affirming the differences? Paganism means paganistic. Like, yes, and what is pagan? What does it mean to be pagan? I don't know, but I think that uh, there is a difference that um, God reaches people in paganistic. What happens with people? No, God? And I think that, the, yeah, the, uh, it's kind of the God comes to reach people and gets through them in paganistic. Hmm. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> what, what happens with God? God does what? Reaches. Re reaches, goes in and grabs a person. I mean, instead of trying to reach God being a religious kind of thing, they take drugs and they think that God gets <laughs> into them, kind of, and express. Help him, somebody. Yeah, <laughs> and it's a, it's a sort of direct experience. Okay, is that what you're saying? Yeah. It's kind of they don't have to take drugs, do they? No, um, yeah. <laughs> no but, 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 but it helps, is that what you're going to say? It that? also helps. They don't have just one God. They have yeah. God for everything. Yes, yeah, right. So, uh, so, so, so it makes it a lot, yeah, a lot less sort of... It's closely religious. related to nature and, and forces of nature and how you uh, align yourself with these forces and then you choose your gods and uh, act according to what is required. Yeah. Maybe also a more direct way of explaining or finding a reason or a motivation because you can, there's kind of a, a driving, just things are explained through supernatural in, in a more kind of direct and immediate way. Isn't it simpler than that? They, they, they view, paganistic view, um, embraces um, all forms of animalism as, um, um, as being um, as being, I use the word affirming, as affirming their world view, it's, it's, it's kind of, everything is, everything is celebrated, almost. Um, is, that, is, that, is that a fair? Well, it's it, Bacchanalia in that sense, yeah. Yeah, that's how I think, yeah. So, so r rather than worship, they encounter, is that sort of engage anybody? Rather than worship, they encounter, yes. So the encounter becomes a primary form of worship. Yes, which is what you were trying to say, but they, you don't really need to take the drugs for that. <laughs> no, I, I, I've said for the drugs because they, they are some really ancient. Yes, that's true. That's no, no, that's true. But it's very important, this notion of the animal, that it, the animal is not divided off from the human. That it's a disruption of the binary in all, pardon me, in all forms. So you have here, although the libidinal ban allows Leotard to show what is necessarily excluded by representational thinking, it is not to be considered to be descriptively true, since the model would then collapse back into representation. Why? Because if, if the argument that Leotard is putting here is dealing with this question of the libidinal ban, it's dealing with this, not question of the libidinal ban, this, this move toward a mobis dimensional environment, if it is something outside of the realm of conception, it's just describing what you see, then you're going to fall back into the problem of representation. You're going to fall back exactly to the problem you're trying to criticize and get rid of. So the first thing, you, the first takeaway from this, the first point you need to try and remember, is that this <coughs> move to a thing called a libidinal ban is a way to invest the plane of imminence with rawness, with the raw energy. So that you don't think of a plane of imminence as a kind of magic carpet ride kind of thing, but you see that it's as a mobis strip, it's an economy. There's different things that come together that create the vitality of its life that you're within. And you can then get off the libidinal band by, you know, it's like 
by going to what could be considered home, but isn't home. Let's say let's say home is here. Let's say this is home. Then you leave here, and it doesn't feel like you're home. This is home. So this creates. I've asked this before. What's the surface of this room? What's the surface of this seminar? The surface of the seminar is not. You wouldn't draw the inside of this. You wouldn't draw the table. If I said to you, how do you create the energy, the intensity of what's happening in the seminar, I would be amazed if you start drawing the, <laughs> the room, though it is a place. But the place is, is a modus strip of a place. It's, it's, it's a dimensional place. So when you step out of the place, it feels like it could evaporate. And when you step back in a place, it's there. So, but there's there's more than one Mobius strip type of scenario going on. And so he's talking about how these moments, these Mobi these economies, he calls them libidinal economies, how they create these energy fields around which you can then operate. Nick, what are you? Well, I, was, I was just thinking. I mean, aren't they all that sort of analog, the sort of plane of eminence and? Yes, they are. Yeah, they're all analogical. They're all analogical. Yeah. The difference being, or well, the difference that, I mean, maybe it's, uh, you know, the difference in uh, small difference of narcissism, whatever the expression is. Yeah. But <clears throat> the, the, what is being proposed by Leotard, he's saying, this is all very interesting, but the thing about Deleuze and Guattari is they keep forgetting sex. They keep importing sexuality or identity into their argument. It's not the argument. Now, now, Leotard is not saying he thinks that people should be gay, straight, bi, transgender, intersectional, any of the, in, intersexual, this kind of thing. He's not saying any of that. What he's saying is that he thinks people should be pagan, that there's a pagan sexuality which runs throughout the, the world. And this paganism takes on different shapes. And it's operated through this band. This, this, this. Now, you, you steal what you want from this. Some of it will work, some of it won't. Be careful what you steal. But it's, 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 so let's do this again. Although the libidinal band allows Leotard to show what is necessarily excluded by representational thinking, it is not to be considered, the band itself is not to be understood as a descriptive truth. Since if the band were describing the truth, then you'd end up being representational. So he's basically saying, but as more forceful and more interesting and more inventive than, it, than previous totalizations of the real. So he's going to basically say that there's this whole position around universality that the libidinal band breaks. The, the notion of the conceptual unity breaks. And instead, what you have is multiversal thinking, as opposed to universal, multiversal. As a kind of <coughs> as a kind of persuasive fiction, the various descriptions of the band wish the various descriptions of the band wish, nevertheless, to account for the closures and exclusions inherent in representational thinking and suggest a pagan manner of affirming the differences and singularities that run through the libidinal ban in an aleatory and indeterminate fashion. So if we look at, again at the artist's um, work here, Emily Sparks' work, this is aleatory. It's paganistic, but at least she's trying to do something along those lines, and not representational. You, you would never get anywhere with this painting if you thought it was about it was representing a story. <coughs> a story. It's a. It's trying to immerse itself in a pe pagan theatrics. Now, what does it really mean to say that it's talking about representational thinking and suggest a pagan manner of affirming differences and singularities? What does it really mean to say this pagan manner? Well, as David uh, pointed out, it is breaking down all of the border lines between species, between um, male, female divisions, um, 
you know, religious divisions, ethnic divisions, and to think as the animal thinks, whatever that means, without, again, proposing to anthropomorphize an animal. To think with your energy, to think with your rawness, to think with the, um, with, well, with the senses. If that happens, if you can begin to do that, he says that this is the first aspect of a rabbinal ban. But in order for this to make any sense whatsoever, in order for it not to just become a set of platitudes, there's what he calls the bar, or the tensor band, it was the, t the thing that creates something that spins and gives direction on the band. So he says, David, you want to read this on the bar? Sure. The bar. If we imagine the libidinal band as having one surface, white hot, labyrinthine, and aleatory. What does aleatory mean? It means to um, not uh, go. It's kind of um, to go sideways. Yeah, to to, yeah, to, yeah, to go. Yeah, to go a different way. Yeah. yeah. Good. good. Chance random. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Or rhizomatic. Notice one of them calls it rhizomatic. The other one calls it aleatory. Anyway, go on. Then the bar is to be seen as the operator of disintensification, which, in slowing down, allows the displaceability and non-identity of the drives slash pulsions and, uh, and intensities to be arrested and given a de designation and signification. And when it's speeded up? Do you want me to speed it up? No, no, no. When the, no I wanted you to think about what I wanted all of us to think about the. If we imagine the little libidinal band is having one surface that, that is to say a singularity, not a not an amount, uh, white hot labyrinthine and aleatory, then the bar is to be seen as the operator of disintensification. So that is to say, how do you get something to rest on a surface? How do you get something to stick on something that doesn't really exist? As, how do you get the food fight to make any sense? after you step outside of the environment of the cafe, of the Stonewall Cafe? Well, it has to slow down. Somehow, there's a question of speeding up, slowing down, but what he's arguing is that if you want to see how this rests on the bar, you have to slow down time. You have to slow it right down. Nietzsche talks about this as well, the importance of being slow. the importance of, of you know, I, I think I would recommend anyone to do Tai Chi. So you really learn the movements, the slowness of how, you know, energies can, can form. And once you see the slowness of it, or once you can feel the slowness of it, you see how they get established on the bar. Otherwise, it just looks like it just sort of popped up and happened. But you can't always slow things down. You can't always speed them up. You have to understand how it's working. So he's basically saying that you have a displaceability and non-identity of the drives, pulsions, and intensities to be arrested and given a designation. So not everything that gets slowed down matters. Again, it, quote, depends. And here, you being an artist is critical because now he's folding back on, on Heidegger and the question of the techna. What do you grab? Do you grab what's close to hand, or do you grab what's close to what it is you're playing with? Whatever that is. What's that, te what's that technique involved? It is through procedures of exclusion, notably negation, and exteriorization, that the bar gives birth to the conceptual process, twisting the band into what Leotard calls the theatrical volume. Now that's a, so don't forget that word, the theatrical volume, which when I was looking, when, I was, when we were part of James's seminar, you could see the theatrical volume going up and down, not just because of the uh, undulating voice, but the way in which things started to come together in a, in a in a moment that would make sense, and then they would just dissipate. That's the theatrical volume. Dividing up what takes place on the band into a this 
and are not this. The bar, as it cools down, accounts for the series of conceptual frontiers which distinguish the ideal and the real, the authentic and the alienated, the useful and the exchangeable, the normal and the perverse, etc. It should be noted that, for Leotard, the bar and the band are nevertheless one and the same. When the bar rotates in a furious, aleatory fashion, we have something like the libidinal band. When the bar slows down, we have something like the theatrical volume. Why the bar slows down is a question peculiar to rep representational thinking, itself an effect of the cooling bar. One last thing we have to read before and that is the great zero. Now the great zero is the same as the Heideggerian equal sign. The equal sign can be represented in our minds as an equal sign. Pull something together. But it also could be the zero in as much as the zero means a plane of imminence. It's a good title. The zero. The great zero. The great zero. It's good, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you should steal that. I think you may be. Oh, sorry, am I carrying on? Yeah. Um, the great zero. The name Leotard gives to the instance informing a particular but insistent dis dispositif on the libidinal band. With the disintensification of the bar, the libidinal band is folded back into a theatrical volume, which has an inside and an outside, bracket, appearance, essence, signs the signified. The inside is then ultimately considered in terms of what is going on on the outside. One of the most important figurations of the outside is the great zero, which serves as the general term to cover the platonic world of forms, God, the authentic mode of production, the phallus, etc. All these instances and despite their difference, differences, are effects of the slowing down of the bar, referring the intensities running through the band to an elsewhere which they appear to lack once they have been confined to the interiority of a volume. The great zero is thus an empty centre, which reduces the present complexity of what happens instantaneously on the band to a chamber of presence and absence. In his descriptions of the great zero, Leotard wishes to show that all theories of signification are fundamentally nihilistic. How do you understand that? I was reading it, so it's, it's, uh, it's odd being the speaker. Um, I understand it to mean that the, the first bit, I think, to, to look at is that when he uses the word dispositif, because that's important to understand what the word is itself. And what is it? Um, it's com combining um, dispose and disposition, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, so it, it's uh, he's using that to mean um, <coughs> something that is um, both different and has uh, a quality possible in it to be outside of the thing it inhabits. Was that alright? Yep. Nice. Okay. Um, and so because. Um, of the outside um, that we um, come to understand, um, he is able to explain that these are merely figurations that in fact do not give meaning to what, or give sense if you like, to what is um, being, um, what is happening. In fact, all they do um, are, if you like, detract by conceptually I'll say owning the position of the situation. Um, okay, did anybody not get that? Yeah. Probably in the review. Yeah, Can yeah you re didn't. because it, it, it's very common <laughs> what you're saying. <laughs> Try it again. Um, so start with dispositive. Yeah, okay, so. Because, or look like this the great zero, I just said, is like the equal sign with the Heideggerian mu. And then when you read it, it sounds like this sounds like Hegel. Or it sounds like you've got inside, outside, this, not this. What's the story? So, the story is that you can, there has to be a different kind of logic to, to doing, thinking, making art, making meaning, making the, the whole thing 
However, in reality, one is always forced in a position of representation. And that's the rub. And that's what Leotard is saying. Deleuze and Guattari don't seem to get their head around. They don't seem to realize that you can have a radical revolution, but you have to at least understand that you're fighting things that still take a stand and create misery because of the way in which it, it, the, the great bar is slowed down and imposes the, the sort of empty phallus moves. And that, you, that one has to understand in one's own work how this relationship is going between representation as a logic, as a form, as a form of art and everything, plus the analogical. And that's more or less what you said, but in a different way. Can you can now can you just restate your position around dispositif? Um, the dispositif um, is a combination of dispo uh, to, to dispose and disposition, which implies that it is both um, a um, a shift away from um, and a also a throwing away of. But there, there is an off that is thrown away, um, and that insists. So that's what that's why the that's why the, that's why the translator has not re repeatedly put dispositive as two different words because the word itself is conceptually understood integral to the work. Yeah, good. 